Next on, we're going to have uh, Frank. Frank is number one, an amazing photographer, even though he, he won't necessarily talk about this today. <laughs> yes, you are an amazing photographer. Uh, <laughs> He's an entrepreneur, uh, well-known for Nextcloud, and he's going to talk to us about AI today. So new talents that are discovered uh, today, Frank. A uh, big round of applause, and uh, let's get us started. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Uh, it's really great to be here. I really, I really love this event, I have to say. It's really great people, great community, and it's really, really an honor to be here. So, um, yeah, I will not talk about photography indeed, <laughs> but about uh, the hot topic, which is AI, uh, obviously, um, and what it means um, for all of us. Um, a little bit about me. Um, some people might know me. I'm doing open source for 25 years. Also, all kinds of different projects. I was part of the KDE community forever and um, doing other things like working with the W3C, um, helping a little bit with lobbying for open source for, uh, at a European Commission, um, helping the United Nations with the open source strategy, but I'm probably invited here as the founder and CEO of Nextcloud. So I want to talk first a little bit about Nextcloud. It should not be an advertising presentation, but I think it's important for the context to just describe a little bit what it is um, to give you the right setting for that. After that, I want to talk about our ethical AI framework that we developed. Uh, earlier this year, then about our actual AI features, the next load assistant. And at the end, there's this question about what this actually means uh, to be open source in the AI world. So first, a little bit about Nextcloud. Um, I started this whole journey a um, long time ago when it was clear that we have a huge power concentration in the IT world, that basically uh, just a few companies, a few um, big companies, they're storing all data, they're processing all data, they have all the communication of every human on the planet, and this is a dystopia that I don't really like. So as an open source person, I thought, okay, we need to have a decentralized alternative. We want to have an alternative to all these companies, to these features, but it should be completely open source, you should be able to host and host it and run it yourself. From a positioning perspective, um, this uh, looks a little bit like that. I always call the file server our grandpa. It's like, um, like from the 80s and 90s. After that came file sync and share. That's basically the idea that you can like, sync your files to your phone, have a web interface, send out a share link, um, have versioning, encryption, and so on. But of course, nowadays, what we're really talking about is collaboration software. So that software that is somewhere accessible on the internet and people use it to communicate and collaborate together. Um, so also a bit of products associated to that. Of course, file servers, Novell, Windows, Samba, and stuff like that. Then Dropbox and OneDrive. But at the end, the collaboration space is what's really personally for me also very interesting, is that we talk about Google Workspace and Microsoft 365 as the two uh, proprietary um, giants here. And Nextcloud Hub, um, we see ourselves as the open source alternative to that. This is also why Nextcloud is structured in that way. So we have four big um, yeah, core products, I would say. There's the file part for files you can share. There is talk for chat and video conferencing. There's groupware for mail, calendar, and contacts, and office for editing um, documents together. Um, all of that under the umbrella Nextcloud Hub. And obviously, the key differentiator is, as I said before, is everything we do is 100% open source and can 100% be self-hosted. So a lot of people, maybe some here in the room, run it on something like a Raspberry Pi at home. It works. I mean, I don't know if I would recommend it. It's a very weak computer, but it works. Yeah, just a few uses, it's fine. But you can really scale it up in a big way. And the biggest installation that we're working with has 20 million users. So 20 million users, and it's basically the same source code, which is, um, I think, quite quite interesting. So this is a differentiator. Similar functionalities to a big tech companies, but completely under your control. So this is what we do. Like <clears throat> Now a little bit into the, into the products. It will be quick, I promise. This is the interface for the file swing and share part. It's basically a file manager. You can upload, download your files, um, tag them, search them, and so on. There are mobile apps, also completely open source 
for um, iOS and for Android. You can access all your files from the from the Go, also with most of the features like sharing, viewing, and so on. Um, and there's also a desktop client for um, for Mac, Windows, and Linux that can synchronize your files between your desktop um, and and your server. Works obviously great with Ubuntu, of course. <laughs> then there are some interesting features, I think, that you can define policies. Um, who can access which file from where. So you can basically, as an administrator, you can say files that are tagged with secure can only be like viewed by people in the family LDAP group from an IP address from Europe um, on a Saturday from a certified device or something like that. So you can really model these interesting policies, which I think are quite interesting. Then there's, of course, end-to-end -end encryption. So we have a quite powerful end-to-end -end encryption with a public-private key system, um, also including sharing with other people. Um, so basically, the, if the system administrator wants to, the system administrator has no way to look into your data. Also, if the server is hacked or something, there's absolutely no way that the data can leak because it, everything is controlled on the clients. Then a little bit about the second part, next loud talk. This is the chat and video conferencing part. It has this usual chat interface that you know from, I don't know, Slack or Microsoft Teams or something like that. Um, can um, do the usual chat operations. You can post all kinds of objects like maps and polls and documents like that. You can edit them then together. Obviously, you can do video calls. Um, again, we also have um, clients here. So we have additional separate clients for Nextcloud Talk where you can, like a messenger, chat with your people, um, you get call notifications, someone calls you, basically everything you expect from a modern communication tool. But again, everything happens on your server, no data is leaking anywhere else, super easy to self-host. Yeah. And a new feature that we are launching like next week, I think, is a desktop client. So we also have a dedicated uh, desktop client, obviously runs on Linux very nicely. Um, the next part is the groupware part. Uh, we have a nice calendar, also with sharing calendars with others. Um, there we have cool features like connecting to an exchange server. So if your organization still has an exchange server, you can connect all of that to the existing um, backend if you want. There's also a mail client where you can access your mails in a similar way like Gmail, for example, or other solutions. And the fourth part is the Nextcloud Office. This is a quite nice and powerful integrated office in the browser. This is using LibreOffice in the backend. So it um, has very nice compatibility with all kinds of document formats. And you can also do this collaboratively in the browser, of course. You can different people with different cursors working on the same document at the same time. There's a spreadsheet application, obviously also available, also collaboratively working um, and uh, presentation application too. And Something that we are really proud of specifically is that we integrated all the components very nicely together. For example, what you can do, you can have a, a collaborative editing session where several people working on the same document while having a video call with the people while chatting with the people at the same time. So this is very, very nicely integrated. So to summarize it, I think we have a quite nice, or I would say the leading open source alternative to these Microsoft and Google tools. This is what we developed the last uh, seven years, and um, we are quite happy with it. And life is good, and users are happy, and everything is great. This was end of last year, and then uh, came AI. So this is interesting for us, because to be totally honest, I think end of last year, maybe I got a a little bit of a depression or something because I thought, okay, we have this very powerful new tools now that people will like, people will use these AI tools because they help them with productivity, um, but there's no way the open source community can compete with that. This is something where only big tech, only Microsoft, Google, and all the others, they have the resources, they have the engineers, they have the servers, they have the training data, they have all the things that's needed. And we, as a small little uh, open source community project, have absolutely no way to compete with that. So this is what I thought um, 
yeah, December last year. And um, luckily enough, um, we found out that there is actually a way for the open source community to compete. I'll talk about this in a second. First, I want to talk about the ethical part of this whole AI revolution. So obviously, or for me, it was directly obvious that these AI features are very powerful and useful, right? And like the same way computers help us being more productive, right? There's like a, a productivity amplifier computers, and I think AI has the same way. It helps us with creating text and images and summarizing things and putting notifications about the right things and so on. So it has the, has the opportunity, like this picture wants to um, illustrate, that it can be the nice helper, the nice robot, the nice assistant who helps us to make our life better. But obviously, very fast, it became clear that there's also a dark side of AI. It also comes with a lot of problems. Um, and I will talk a little bit about this in a second. So a lot of people are skeptical about the challenges of AI, and I think rightfully so. And not only people, not only open source people like us, also other organizations. For example, if you follow the press, then you know that organizations like Samsung or Apple or Goldman Sachs or others, they're banning ChatGPT. Ready? It's not possible to use it if you work in the for these companies and many others the same. So why is that? Because they're really concerned about the, the problems that come with it. It comes from false information. It's, it's like making something up. It comes with biases and the big pr problem around data leakage, of course, because we have to realize that this is like worse than normal cloud computing, right? In the normal cloud computing world, you just only <laughs> give your data to someone else and trust them that they protect your data. But here you have the challenge that these companies also work with your data. So they use your data as training for the model of the future. And this might then have the effect that you as a company, you're interacting with ChatGPT, for example, and you, I don't know, work on some construction plans or some documents on some strategy, I don't know. And then this data or similar to this data might be presented to your competitor later because it goes into the model, it's used for training, and then it actually might end up in the hands of your competitors. So there's a whole level of, of privacy problems that come with it. So then basically, um, beginning of the year, as Nextcloud, we had this challenge. First, <laughs> if the challenge, can we do it at all? And then also, can we do it right? Can we do it in an ethical way? Because as I described earlier, the mission of Nextcloud is to give everybody control over their data, their privacy, and they can look into the source code and check in there, there's no backdoor in it, and so on and so on, give you all these freedoms. And is it possible to also use the good side of AI without the negative parts? Um, and then we thought, okay, we cannot just implement something. Um, we really want to put this into the perspective and give our users the choice what they actually do with it. So we developed this ethical AI framework because ethical is a big word, obviously. So what is this in the first place? So what we did, we well talked with experts and looked into the press. It was not so hard. Everybody was talking about AI, about the potential problems um, of that. So one problem that everybody was talking about is obviously the discrimination. As you know, there's training data used going into these models, and based on that, it's giving you answers. Right? If you ask stable diffusion to create a photo of a doctor, it's most likely a white man. Right? So obviously, there's bias in there, and with text generation, the same. And this is, of course, a problem. Second problem of the AI revolution is the CO2 footprint. And as you know, for creating these large language models, you need like a lot of uh, yeah, power, lots of GPUs, um, using a lot of electricity, creating a lot of um, CO2 emissions. So this is a problem that we want to be aware of, want to inform our users about what this means and what they're actually doing there. And then the next one is the privacy respecting part. As I said earlier, do I really want to send all my data to some other organization? Do I know what's happening with them? Um, and what's, is it used as a training data or not? So can I keep my stuff under control in the same way? We as open source community like to keep our stuff local and on-premise and under control. Is it the same here or not? And then um, last point is, of course, 
what is the cost of that? Is this even freely available for everybody? Can also people in developing countries also use this or they need to pay tons of money to Microsoft to use it? So is this even possible to have it really freely available? So these are like core challenges of the AI revolution that we identified. What we then did is we created this traffic light system. So we have three requirements and based on um, how these three require requirements are fulfilled, we give like this traffic light um, rating to all the different features. The first requirement for ethical AI is open source. I don't think I need to convince a lot of people here in this room why this is important, um, but it, it is. Let me explain why it is, because if the code, and with code I mean the code that's used to train a model, and also the code that's used to use a model to interfere with it. This needs to be open source. Why is that? Because only then you can run it locally, you can look inside, and you can also optimize it over time. First of all, you can only then you can actually measure, for example, the electricity usage, right? Because if you use Google or Microsoft or someone else, I don't even tell you, right? It's not transparent. Only here you can actually um, measure it and you can optimize it as you optimize other software too. So open source is important. Second is the model needs to be freely available. Why is this important? Because then you can run it locally. Right? Something like GBT4 obviously is not freely available, only exists on the service of OpenAI, which is a problem, for all these reasons I mentioned earlier. And if it's freely available, you can run it on your local machine. That's a good thing. And the third requirement is that the training data is freely available because then you can actually look inside and you can check if there's a bias in there or not. And if there's a bias in the training data, you can improve it and fix it, retrain it, and then have a better model, which is more balanced and better. So from our perspective, these three things are requirements for, the, for, the, um, for an ethical AI system. And we created like this rating, as I said, green if all three are checked, red is none of is checked. Um, what we then also did is for all the AI features we have in Nextcloud, we give the user a choice. So this is a, an example from the configuration interface. For example, here you have different AI features listed. The first one is a translation system. So we have a built-in translation. I will show it to you in a second. And there you can choose, hey, um, do I want to use the OpenAI ChatGPT translation service for that? Or do I want to use a local running open source model? It's the, for example, here the Opus model coming from the Helsinki University, which runs completely on premise and is fully open source and runs completely local. If you install these apps, you see then this rating system in the, in the app store configuration. So as an admin, you can decide, do I want to use something that is green or yellow or red? And I have the full choice. And this is for every feature. I see the speech to text, for example, Again, you can say, hey, I want to use the Whisper service or I want to have actually a locally running uh, Whisper um, implementation that we have nicely packaged and can be run with one click. And the same for all the other services too. So that's our strategy that we make it transparent. What, how is it working? Um, is, it, is it transparent or not? Is it open source or not? And give the users a choice and give the rating and you can decide what you do. But obviously, I mean, we have these integrations in all these commercial um, AI systems on the internet, but obviously our focus as a real open source organization, our focus is on the local and, and open source AI system. So we have a full dedicated team now, because as I said earlier, luckily beginning of the year, it became clear that we can compete with these big tech companies. Obviously not alone. We do this in a very nice open source where, uh, way where we collaborate and work together with a big community. And there is a big open source community around AI now. And we have a dedicated team now to develop like the ethical AI features. And I want to show you um, some of them now. So a month ago, um, we launched the latest iteration of it. This is the next cloud assistant. And this is a fully local running LLM system, which can do all kinds of things. And I will, I will show it to you in a, in a second. We are quite on a run here with the releases. So we had a release in February, then in April, then in September, and there's actually another one planned in December. 
And with every release like this year, we improve this AI, same as the rest of Nextcloud, obviously, but we improve all these AI features more and more, and there's really a lot that we can do. So Nextcloud Assistant. Um, this is a large language model. Um, this is 100% open source, and um, this can be fully, fully self-hosted. So this also runs on a relatively weak machine. I mean, it depends what you do, how many users you have. If you run it on a Raspberry Pi, which is possible, then it's possible that some operations actually take some time. That, I don't know, if you ask a question, the answer takes maybe a minute or something. Obviously, if you have a faster server or even a GPU in it, which is optional, um, then it's obviously a lot faster and same speed as proprietary systems. So what can the assistant do? So here are a bunch of basic features, and I will go into deeper into a little bit more um, in a second. Um, it can do face recognition, for example, in your photos, or if you upload your, your photos, um, it can detect faces, it can, can detect objects. You can then search for a bicycle and find all the photos with bicycle in it. Um, there's a smart inbox in mail, so you have a priority inbox that the important mails are, are on top. It can recommend shares and recommend files to you. Um, there's a translation system and, and many other things. I will show you some more interesting ones uh, now directly. So what you can do is you can, on the top of the next cloud um, menu bar, there's a button for the assistant and you can click on it any time and you get, an, you get an overview where at any time you can ask questions um, and yeah, do all kinds of things you know from uh, ChatGPT. But really interesting is, of course, the way we integrate it into the applications themselves. So, for example, if you, um, if you write an email, you can say, hey, I don't really want to write an email. I don't know how to say it or something. There's a button, and then you can say, hey, generate this birthday invitation for me. And then uh, it generates the email for you, and you can just directly edit it and send it. So this is very nicely integrated. Then. In any other place in Nextcloud where you're working with a text, and this our, our, our collaborative Markdown editor, for example, but also works in Office documents, at any time there's a text, you can click on the side on the button and say, hey, make this text longer or shorter or translate it or reformulate it or something. And that's obviously very, very helpful for everybody who works with text. Um, in Nextcloud Office, um, it's the same. Let me see, there's an animation. Yeah. You click the button, you say, hey, I want to generate some text. This here is, uh, says ChatGPT, but it's the same as the local one, and it generates like a contract proposal, for example, for me, for you. Um, so you don't really need to copy paste from one website to another. It's basically directly integrated into all the, all the applications. Then let's say you're in a chat conversation. Maybe you're in, I don't know, your marketing team and you discuss some brainstorming or some visuals, I don't know that you can say, hey, I want to visualize something. I want to have a photo of some bracelet. I don't know. Um, and then it generates a photo and posts it directly into the chat, and everybody can see it and talk about it. So this is also it's very, very useful to have it directly in the application. Then um, there is, of course, a way to for dictation. So some people like to dictate their mail or their texts or whatever. And there's the whisper service obviously integrated. So in any time, any place in Nextcloud, you can just dictate something and have it in there. And there's the same system we also use for the transcription service for video calls. So let's say you do a video call, you automatically get a, a transcript of the video call afterwards that everybody can use. And this can also be in the, um, combined with the summarization feature I showed earlier. So you can also get like in the end of the call, a nice, uh, summary of everything. Then the next load assistant can also act like a person. So in any conversation, any chat conversation you are, at any time you can say, hey, assistant, and ask any questions. Hey, maybe you're, you're planning an event like that here. Say, hey, assistant, what are the most important things to organize a trade show? And then the assistant answers in the chat directly as a person. Um, this obviously can also be very helpful if you just need any any additional information. And I can also tell you a secret a little bit, uh, like a pre-announcement that we usually don't do, but we're also working on a way where the assistant can work with your own local data. So in the future, you can ask us, uh, your assistant questions about, hey, 
how happy is this customer and they look into your emails and gets you the answer or you can say hey what is the uh, some biggest sales numbers if you look into the sales folder and can look into pdfs and gives you answers like that so this assistant is quite um quite useful it's also integrated in mail for example maybe you have a very very long mail thread i think we open source people sometimes tend to have, at least in the past, uh, super long mail conversations about everything. Um, this Nextcloud mail can summarize a mail thread for you and just show you the summary, summary on top of that. Um, then we also have some more technical features. For example, there's also a locally running uh, neural network that is analyzing the login behavior of the people into your service. And if someone who is usually not logging in the middle of the night from a different continent something like that happens. It can, for example, trigger two-factor authentication or log the account or write something or log file, different options. Um, and then the last feature I want to show you here is document classification. So there's also a way where we can analyze the content of all kinds of documents that we can detect, like, I don't know, credit card numbers, social security numbers, and other things. Then the documents can be tagged with that. Um, with this attribute and the feature I showed you at the beginning that we can block access to documents based on different conditions can be combined. So we can say if there's in the organization, if there's a document with some, I don't know, confidential data, then no one really can share it to external people or something. So we can really build that. Um, I want to show you now a bit of a video that summarizes all the features um, that we have today in the AI area. Let's see if this works. Meet Christine, a project manager whose curiosity in AI-driven collaboration has led her to explore various articles on the subject. She reads that the use of AI can be risky, especially when handling sensitive company and customer data. But with NextCloud Hub, those hindrances are no longer a concern for her. She knows that all data is strictly handled on the NextCloud server and is not leaking or being used by another company to train their AI platforms. Let's see how these features play out in Christine's daily work. Yesterday, Christine received an email from Margo, which included a detailed document outlining observations and metrics of quality issues within the company. In that same email, Margo asks Christine to create an outline for a project aimed at addressing these challenges and to discuss this project approach in a call the next day. Her team also received that mail from Margo, and members sent in suggestions. Really great to see that many ideas, but the mail thread is far too lengthy to read. Christine definitely wants to use the suggestions from her team. She asks the assistant to compile and summarize these insights from her team. Then she goes back to the document from her manager. Christine wants to tap into the collective brain power of her team and the AI, and with the summarized insights in hand, Christine directs the assistant to create a project outline. The on-premises AI capabilities of NextCloud Hub enable her to craft an efficient plan for Margo. The assistant completes the project outline, and Christine shares it in a NextCloud talk room with her manager. Christine asks Margo if she can record it, so she can have the transcript of the conversation to share with her team. An engaging meeting ensues. After the conversation, the call summary bot summarizes the meeting and shares tasks from the conversation. Christine incorporates this task list and the transcript of the conversation into the project outline for her and her team. After the meeting, Christine notices that a couple of tasks need to be delegated to Zarina from the German team. She selects the whole task list and uses Nextcloud Translate to get a German version. Now, this can easily be put in a task for our German team, directly from text. Nextcloud Hub's built-in AI capabilities helped Christine to tackle this challenge within her organization much more quickly and efficiently as otherwise would have been possible. And she did not have to worry about any of this data leaking to a third party, neither the translation nor the new project plan nor the content of the call transcript that was created by AI. Christine feels in control and she stays informed without feeling overwhelmed. NextCloud Hub helps Christine to digest key information for this meeting and other tasks and projects. Explore how NextCloud Hub can help you redefine your organization's collaboration.
offering trustworthy AI for smart productivity and robust security. Okay, so um, this is basically what we developed in the last 10 months. And I'm, I'm really happy that it's actually possible for the open source community to, to do this stuff and, and to compete and have it run uh, locally. Now I want to talk about like the last topic, which is the whole discussion about uh, open source um, and, and I, what does it actually mean? I mean, for us, open source is mostly about open source software and open source software is obviously very clearly defined by the OSI and uh, um, the FSF. Um, but obviously open source as a term is also used by a lot of other people for other things. So nowadays there's open source books and open source cars. I don't know what this is. It's not really clearly defined. And everybody's also talking about open source AI. Um, it's also not completely clear what this means because there is not a proper proper definition. So I want to encourage everybody to participate in this discussion that we as open source community are in control of the definition of what this means because this term is just thrown around by a lot of marketing people from big companies and not really clear. There's at the moment an initiative from the OSI, the open source initiative, to, um, they have working group, they have lots of meetings to define what open source um, AI actually means. And I think um, we all should be, should be, uh, should participate in that. So from my perspective, I'm obviously a bit biased here, but like th these three requirements from my perspective are maybe a, maybe a good start. And the good thing is that it's actually sort of in sync with the other definitions for software. So I have here the four freedoms from the FFF. Uh, Richard Stallman wrote those in the in the 80s, uh, as most of you might know. It defines what this freedom means regarding software, that you can um, run it as you want, that you can modify it, which requires the source code, that you can share it with others, um, and so on. Um, and then there is the open source definition from the OSI, which is longer, this has 10 points, but the meaning is basically the same, I would say. It also comes with the freedom to redistribute it, to look into the source code, to have derived works, and so on. Yeah. Happening? <laughs> okay, I can improvise. Um, so it basically has the same um, same requirements. Um, and I think with AI, we should look into something similar, where everybody should have the right to use the model but also then should have the right to look inside how it works and modify the model, which in the case of AI means access to the training data and, uh, um, and the code to train the model. I think that's something that is, um, that is important. And only then, I think it's a really true, um, I don't think it's a blackout button. No. <laughs> uh, only then it's a true uh, open source AI. So there are some, um, who, for example, call the models from uh, Meta, like the Llama model, for example, open source. And I think for me, this is more free as in beer and not free as in freedom, because you can actually use it, but you cannot really see how it works. You cannot really reproduce it and you cannot really, um, yeah, basically look inside, which requires the source code, um, from my perspective, than the training data. So I'm basically at the end of the talk now anyway, so no problem. <laughs> the summary from my perspective is that um, ethical AI is possible, but just we as an open source community have the duty to um, do it in the right way. It's possible to run it locally. That's something where just a year ago, no one thought it's even possible. It is possible to run it locally on normal computers. Right? It is also possible to control the CO2 footprint from my perspective, and it's possible to control the bias if you have access to the training data, which is unfortunately most of the time. Yeah. Didn't touch anything. But it's okay, because I'm actually done. <laughs> so thanks a lot for the presentation, and uh, maybe now we have time for some questions. First question over there, and then we'll come here. Hi. 
Um, you mentioned one of the problems with using uh, a hosted AI is that it could be using your data to retrain itself. Now, with the local deployment on-premise, that might be desirable. Is this possible with Nextcloud? Um, no. So the way I see it at the moment, but again, the world is changing every, every, every week here at the moment. The way we see it, that what you want to have is are ready, trained, large language models, foundation models that take a lot of resources. This is something we cannot really do efficiently uh, locally. And this is what we already have integrated. Then what you also might want to do is to fine tuning on top of those. So fine tuning is a process where you take a model that's already there and you basically give it additional information, additional data. So this is a project we are doing together with the German government at the moment, where we take an existing model and we adding like specific documents, for example, I don't know, tax return documents or something that government people do. <laughs> and we're basically adding this on top of an existing model so that it actually knows these kinds of things and can be used. And this is also something that takes quite some resources. And this is something we, you need to do offline. You definitely need the GPUs for that, for example. And then the next thing, you, um, that, we, that we are doing um, is that you're adding other custom data uh, via vector databases. This is the assistant feature I mentioned earlier, where you can access your local data in a chat interface, for example. But this is something that is stored in a vector database, which doesn't really require uh, training a, a model. So um, at the moment, like Nextload itself cannot really train itself. At the moment, I don't think this would be useful or practical, but again, maybe, I don't know what happens next month. Okay, um, so my question will be about interaction between the human being and the artificial intelligence. So, uh, I, you know, maybe you know what uh, Pavlo, Pavlo's dog, yeah. and how you think uh, to avoid uh, that uh, artificial intelligent will do or will not do interaction with human in the Pavlov's dog uh, theory? I have no idea. <laughs> but I think there will be a panel about AI tomorrow, quite early at nine o'clock, I think, about exactly these topics. Um, I will be there together with some people who know a lot more about this. And I think maybe you can repeat the question tomorrow. Hmm? Sorry, there was a bunch. Of... So, but should I? Okay. Um, a question. So, uh, I have a question. If I am training my own models, or can I integrate them in the next door? Yeah. So, this is there is an abstraction. We built an abstraction for that. So, we ourselves can also swap out the models below it because it's also something that changes all the time. At the moment, the most um, promising ones are, is, the, is the Lama 2, it's the Falcon model, and it's the uh, Mistral model. I think these are the best at the moment, but I'm sure next week there will be another one and we can, you can swap this out and you have your own, you can also plug it in. By the way, we don't only have like one model, it's maybe it's 10 or something overall for the different things, right? The image generation is different. The, the login detection is different. Uh, face detection is different. So they're different models, and but they're all swappable. Yeah. So a question in the back here. Um, so you mentioned at the beginning one of the core challenges as being the CO2 footprint of uh, the training of these models. And I was wondering what Nextcloud is doing in that respect. Um, also, just to say thank you for raising that issue. Uh, often over. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Obviously, we cannot do any miracles there. What I think is the first step, that's for sure, is that it's transparent. So at least with this soft system, you can at least measure it. I mean, with Copilot or ChatGPT, you no one knows, right? And if you ask the companies, they won't answer it. And they also don't care because this all comes from some other magical money sources. Um, but here, at least you can measure it. And because everything is local, the source code is open source, training data is open source, you can actually improve it over time. For example, if there's a new version of PyTorch available or something that is somehow more efficient, I can 
put it in and then it's more efficient. We don't have a magic bullet there, but I will at least this flexibility and the transparency, I think, is a first step. So um, it's great to have a pre-trained model, right? And uh, But the problem is that as time elapses, as uh, we get the answers by the model, we want to make it better, right? And sometimes fine-tuning with our own data is not enough because there are other companies, other people that are doing the same thing that we are doing that could actually contribute to that, um, to our learn, to our uh, results being better. Have you done anything, um, something like in the federated learning stuff in order to collaborate different um, companies of the same thing, like different servers of the same thing, different data yeah. that could be used as the same thing? There's a whole there's a whole movement about this. Um, there is um, most people might know Hacking Face the community, um, and on Hacking Face you do not only have like models, but you also have training sets available that people share with each other. Um, and a lot of organizations do, a lot of research people do. They're provided as freely available training sets, maybe Creative Commons or something, and then everybody can build on top of it, and it all gets better. So. Yeah. Yeah, but sometimes this data is private, right? So, for example, if I want to train on uh, facial recognition or healthcare data, that's not the case, right? So, yeah. I mean, yeah, sure. I mean, this project we're doing with the German government, this is then anonymized, for example. It's possible to remove, like, uh, names and stuff, personalized data, and keep the artist data in. But if it's, like, really, truly private data, like my emails or something, then, um, yeah, I mean, then I don't want to share that, right? Then that's only all I can do. So there's, I don't know what the solution could be. It was federated. Okay, one more question. Okay. Okay. Um, Erosion goes on, and we actually don't uh, know how uh, these models work and uh, predict their results. Is uh, is any way to be sure what there is no backdoor already in current models in your next quote release? Mm, not sure I understood correctly. The question is, if the uh, answers we get from a model is always the best, and there might be another which is better? Not. Uh, the question is about security. Ah. So we don't control models. We are already avoided above our level. And are you sure what uh, your next code really don't have backdoor in these models, so our data will go away from organization? Um, that's very interesting. So at the moment, everything we do is that you basically interact with a model and the model gives you output like text or images or something. At the moment, these AI systems, they cannot really do anything themselves. This, I think, is a very interesting discussion maybe for next year. Um, there's also other companies also have the same, like Copilot, you can ask questions, but Copilot cannot really do anything themselves, right? You don't wake up in the morning and Copilot says, hey, I finished your program overnight. And that's not how it works, right? Okay. And then we really have this, then, then I think the security questions you raised, then it gets really interesting, right? Because once we give this model's powers to do something, to send mails in my name or to order stuff online in my name, then the security questions you raised are really interesting and really important. At the moment, it's their passive system, so I don't think there's a problem yet. Uh, actually, we active by nature. We do calculation to give us the answers. Yeah, the answers might be wrong and might lead me into a wrong direction. That's true. In a way, this could also be a security thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this super interesting question. Yeah. Okay, so other open, uh, other open source projects are also working on integrating AI, such as Home Assistant. 
and they are designing uh, protocols to allow them to interoperate with uh, other systems. Is this something you have been considering? Um, not, not really. But I find this, I find this also another super interesting question because we will, we will have for, just look at emails. It's super easy to write super long emails now that no one can read anymore. And then you have other AI systems that summarizing it back for you. So we will have a world very, very soon where if you don't have these AI features, you like you can no longer work because your coworkers are just spamming you. Hey, I have another hundred page document, how to improve our marketing here, read it. And then no one can process that. You need an AI system summarizing it back. Right? But then if you're then into a world where the actually mails that are sent are no longer read by actually humans. They're created by machines and they're read by machines. Then the question is, maybe at some point they develop some kind of special language they use for that, right? It might be still technically English words, but they're putting some stuff in that is not even usable for humans. Yeah, but my question, <laughs> my question was more in, in the sense of uh, whether we can use uh, next cloud to be a backend for uh, the AI of other systems like uh, Home Assistant, yeah. which they also are using, and, and they and they created this protocol called Wyoming, which allows them to run the containers that actually run the the, the models uh, on other machines and stuff like that. So, um, so what we developed. There was a slide, but it was black. Sorry for that. <laughs> but we developed a, like a, a special new API. That's a new microservices API that we use to integrate all kinds of AI systems into Nextcloud. Because by itself, it's the normal app system we have. It's PHP based. And if you want to use a different language, that's a problem. So if you want to use Python, for example, or Go or something, you have these new microservices architecture where you can integrate these things. But it's still everything is in the Nextcloud universe. We don't really do any APIs with other systems. It would maybe be a little bit against our philosophy because it's all about keeping your data private. When stuff is floating to some other machines, I don't know. That's well, it open, um, Home Assistant uh, shares the same type of philosophy. So they allow you to run totally locally uh, AI also. You can also choose to not use local, so that's yeah. that's why I, yeah. I thought there are coincidences uh, of philosophies. So maybe there could be uh, an ecosystem that uh, integrates between yeah. those two projects. Yeah, something to look into. Yeah. Question. So um, when you talk about ethical AI, it kind of makes sense that the evaluation. Would it be applicable to all of the members of one deployment of Nextcloud, right? But when, once you're crossing the boundary, you might cross into different decisions. So what one deployment might consider ethical, another one might not, right? Yeah. Or what one group of users might think it's a, okay, for example, sending birthday invitations auto-generated, another group might think, okay, that's too far. Um, is there any work on defining an API to exchange that information? Um, not at the moment, but it's also very interesting. I mean, that's a fundamental problem you have on the internet always. Right? Like maybe you just look at email again. Right? Let's say you have one next cloud, which is configured in the most secure way. Everything is local, everything is disabled, and then I'm can use the locally AI to write very nice, super confidential, great emails and then sending it to you. And you also use Nextcloud, great, but you activated uh, ChatGPT integration and then it's all sent to OpenAI and they can have access to my mails indirectly, right? And that's the same for chat messages and everything. You sort of need to trust that the other side has the same level of security. Otherwise, you have a problem. I think with AI, it's probably the same. Yeah. Last question there. So we have one, two. We'll have to have maybe for two or three. That's it. So one, two, three. Hey, hey, uh, great talk. Um, I have a question. 
and related to AI. You said you were depressed last uh, December. Um, I hear you. And I want to ask what was sacrificed in terms of the roadmap for Nextcloud to get you to this? Um, in, ter in terms of the product roadmap, not personal, just, just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say nothing. I mean, Nextcloud is developed by the community and by us as a company. From a company perspective, we were 65 people beginning of the year and now we are 100. So hired like 35 people over the year. Um, and some of them went into the AI team and other people in other teams. And um, yeah, nothing was really sacrificed. And community, I don't know. If some community people change priorities here, but not really, no. Thanks. Hello. Thanks for Nextcloud. Awesome software. I mean, I'm using it and I'm really, really happy. So uh, with all that new assistant feature and like new AI features that are coming more and more, you said you can run a Nextcloud on Raspberry Pi. You know, we all try to be as efficient as possible, right? With these new features, the system requirements, how much they will change um, Thank you. Yeah. Well, answer is it depends. <laughs> um, so there are some features like the whole recommendation of shares, file recommendations, uh, login detection, also the face and object recognition. They are very lightweight, so you probably don't even notice it. But that is no this is no problem. I mean, it gets more interesting about image generation and uh, large language models. Um, they're really also run on weak hardware, as I said, but then they're slower. Um, so I think we did some tests with um, the latest stable diffusion that we also have integrated now. And in some circumstances on the Raspberry Pi, it takes like an hour or something to generate a picture. So the user interface, we actually have developed everything asynchronously, so you don't really have to wait. You can fire up the operation, it works in the background, and when, once the image or the text or something is done, it gets a notification, and then you're back there. Which we did to that you don't really have to, that you're not slowed down. But of course, well, then your Raspberry Pi is working 100% CPU load for an hour. Right? Um, yeah. So this is a problem, of course. Yeah. Um, if you have a faster machine or put a GPU in it and it's real time, but of course it also takes more power. So, um, what was the question? <laughs> okay, thanks. So you sort of touched on this. We have this divide between these like wonderful open source models, which are entirely open, maybe get a green light on your scale, but maybe are smaller or less capable than the models that are built by OpenAI, uh, Facebook, maybe Anthropic, that have huge amounts of funding to make these like large models that are much more capable but are very disincentivized to make those open source or even free. Do you have thoughts on if there's any path forward to shifting around those incentives or solving this problem of like the good AI is not open source and the open source AI is bad because there's no funding? Well, I don't know, but this is one of the biggest questions, of course, in this space. Let's, I, let's, it will be very interesting in the next few years, what happens. So all I can say is that a year ago, everybody thought open source can do nothing. Now it seems that can do a lot. Um, there is a constant arms race that even like, I don't know, they're even rating in the scoring system on, on, on hacking phase where you can compare the models all the time. There's always something going up and down and it's a constant arms race. At the moment, there are models that are, the three I mentioned are nearly as good as GPT-3 uh, GPT or 4. Yeah. So at the moment, it looks look like that open source can compete. How this will, work out in the future, no one knows. 
Thank you. I know that's kind of an impossible question. Yeah, I was I, curious to hear what you thought. I'm also not really an AI expert, so yeah, thanks. Brilliant. Well, I think everyone wants probably to go for lunch. Uh, so in the meantime, Frank, amazing. Thanks. Thank you. Much.